Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, What Can We Learn from a Large Gene Expression Data Set? We are delighted to bring this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. I am Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Jeremy Miller, PhD. Dr. Miller is a scientist at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. He joined the Allen Institute in 2011 to help with computational data analysis of the Allen Human Brain Atlas project and has extended its day to transcriptional atlases of the developing human and non-human primate brain. Dr. Miller is currently interested in using large-scale gene expression data to characterize cell types of the mammalian brain and also identify molecular pathways unique to humans. He received his Ph.D. in neuroscience from UCLA, where he studied gene expression changes in the brain in Alzheimer's disease and normal aging. I will now turn it over to Dr. Miller for his presentation. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to talk today, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, as Judy mentioned, I'll talk about what we can learn from large gene expression data sets um, using a data that's really accessible um, from the Allen Institute website. So overall, uh, my talk today is going to basically be where I will give you some um, descriptions of what a few of these atlases are, some um, information about how people typically use these atlases, and then I'll talk about three uh, topics from these atlases that, that we've looked into that we've found very interesting related to some some uh, what we think are interesting biological questions. So the first one will be uh, in human, where we found that genes involved in brain function and dysfunction tend to show consistent expression patterns between adult human brains. Um, the second topic will also involve the uh, mouse brain atlas, where we're looking at convergent and divergent gene expression patterns between the human and the mouse brain. And the third part will be looking at the NIH blueprint non-human primate atlas, um, where we find that gene expression patterns at different layers of cortex uh, change dramatically uh, with age. So um, this is the main portal for the um, Allen Brain Atlas. Um, and so this first part is going to be looking at the Human Brain Atlas, um, which is highlighted in, in yellow. Um, there's also an interesting case study which looks at differential expression between brain regions, which you could also uh, click on if you're interested. So the Allen Human uh, Brain Atlas uh, is a multimodal atlas, which consists of several parts. There's an, um, an imaging MRI component. There's a large format anatomical reference data. There's whole brain histology, um, including uh, missile. And these are what these histology are what was used to delineate the different regions of the brain uh, for the micro uh, microarray component, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and there's some medium format anatomical reference data, including in places hybridization of, in certain areas of the brain of over a thousand genes. Um, the main component that I'll talk about is the uh, transcriptional microarray uh, component, which um, consists of data from six brains. The first two brains have both hemispheres were sampled, and when we found very few, if any, differences between hemispheres, the last four brains were only sampled in um, a single hemisphere. And within each hemisphere, there's data from about 500 different microarrays spanning two to 300 plus brain regions. And so um, and so these, these brain regions were taken by expert anatomists looking at these um, histology data and generating this reference and high precision anatomical reference that could be used for laser microarray of the subcortical areas and then just macroarray effects of the um, neocortical areas. So the way this atlas is generally used um, is you can go on 
on and look up a particular gene of interest. So in this case, I show a heat map for PCDH8, where um, the red represents high expression and the green, re green represents lower expression. So this would be a gene where the expression is high in hippocampus, for example. Um, another uh, common use for this um, atlas would be to look for genes that are differentially expressed between different areas of the brain. So this, um, the case study that I was talking about is what's shown here. And if we're looking for genes that are differentially expressed between the CA3 field and the hippocampus and the globus pallidus, uh, it turns out that PCDH8 is one of the top ones. What we wanted to look at was something slightly different that uses um, pretty much all of the data together, and that is to ask for about consistency between brains. So most uh, studies of gene expression look at, say, one or two um, different Things. So control versus disease, one brain region versus another across a large number of individuals. And what we have is sort of this inverse um, thing here where there's a lot of different brain regions but for a relatively small number of individuals. So what we wanted to see is if we could find genes that are have consistent expression patterns across a small number of individuals across a lot of these brain regions. And so the way that we tested this is we defined a metric that we call differential stability, which is the average Pearson correlation across brain regions for each pair of brains. So I have, again, PCDH8 as an example here in these bar plots. Um, these bar plots represent the average expression for a uh, about 100 regions um, for all the samples from each of the brains. So this is brains 1 through 6. Um, the height of the bar represents expression in a given region. And what you can see is just by eye, these plots look very similar, which means that the correlation between brains across regions for this gene would be high, and therefore this metric for differential stability or for consistency between brains would be high. So this would represent a gene that's very consistent between brains. And what we can do is we can then rank all the genes in the genome based on how well, how consistent they are between brains or the, their amount of differential stability. And so what we did is we hypothesized that genes would show this consistent patterning between brains, that they would be particularly important for function and dysfunction, regardless of their particular pattern in the brain or the expression levels that they have overall. And so um, the way we tested this um, as sort of a first test was to just search in PubMed abstracts for the word brain along with the gene, with a, the particular gene symbol. And so what this plot shows is the green line is the genes ranked based on the differential stability from the, the most consistent on the left to the least consistent on the right. And then the blue line shows the percentage of genes with that up level of um, differential stability that could be found along with brain and PubMed. And there's a pretty good correlation, which basically just shows that the more stable a gene is in the, in the genome, the more related to brain it is in a sort of qualitative way. Um, and so to get at this in a, a, a more quantitative way, um, we looked at this, uh, the top 10% of genes, so the top decile of genes with the highest differential stability, and then similarly for the 10th to 20th percentile, 20th to 30th percentile, and so on. And we looked for enrichment of each of those deciles against um, functional categories of some type. So transcription factor binding sites, gene ontology terms, um, genes associated with microRNAs or drug targets. And what we found is the top decile, the 10% of genes with the most consistent expression between brains, those tend to be the ones that are by far the most enriched for all of these different um, categories, suggesting that these are related to function um, more so than other genes. And so we next want to look at dysfunction. And so the way we looked at dysfunction was to get a set of um, genes that are related to different diseases and disorders. And so we got this, these lists from the Oswork database, which has compiled about 2,500 lists of genes related to different diseases of both the brain and of other organs in the body, the body in general. And we compared all of those gene lists against the differential stability of the genes in that list. And so um, a random set of genes would show up as the bottom pink bar shows to all genes, where they're basically 
scattered evenly across the, um, the genome. Um, but what we find is that genes related to um, diseases of the brain, such as generic mental disorders, schizophrenia, um, epilepsy, dementia, those tend to have higher um, differential stability than, it, than a random set of genes, which is shown by these blue bars being shifted to the right of the plot, the p-value shown in red. Um, however, when we do this for, G for diseases not related to the brain, they do not show this shift. Um, and so it's really what we can say from this is that the genes with the most consistent expression in the brain tend to be related to brain-related diseases, but not so much other diseases. So it is a brain-specific phenomenon that we're finding here. And so the next question that we wanted to ask is, so if we believe now that these genes are related to um, function and dysfunction, one could imagine that either the pattern itself doesn't really matter, it's just the fact that they're consistent, as they hypothesized, or it could be that there's a particular pattern or two, such as high expression in, in cortex across brains or high expression in hippocampus, that matter more than others. Um, and so to get at this, what we did is we um, performed weighted gene co-expression network analysis. And the basic idea here is to take all the genes in the genome and group them into patterns of genes that have similar expression patterns. And then we wanted to check to see whether um, the high differential, the genes with high differential stability were spread out across all of these patterns or were sort of selected to a handful of these different patterns. And so a little background on weighted gene co-expression network analysis. Basically, the way it works is you take the expression level of every single gene across all of the samples of interest. In this case, it would be the brain region, um, the expression level on average in the brain region. You then pairwise correlate all of the genes together, um, which gives you a correlation matrix. This is then converted to a topologic overlap, which is a more biologically robust metric that's very similar to correlation and basically asks how close the neighbors of one gene patterns are to the neighbors of another gene. Um, from that, you can hierarchically cluster genes to group them into these different patterns and then ask um, which gene, what are the patterns and which genes are in each of the different patterns. Um, and so in our case, we want to keep track of the difference of stability of the genes in each of the different patterns. And so when we did this, that's what this next slide is showing, we find 32 robust patterns, which are shown in this top um, left box. Um, this dendrogram basically shows the genes along the x-axis and their, their module grouping, or which pattern they represent in these uh, color bars. Um, below that, there's one example of a pattern, which um, you can see is high in striatum, slightly lower in cerebral cortex and low in most of the subcortical structures. And this is one example. Um, it also has very robust expression patterns across all six brains. On the right, you can see all 32 of these patterns. And it doesn't really matter for this what the different um, regions are. But the important point is that some of these patterns show high regional specificity to a particular brain region. Um, some of them show specificity for a handful of brain regions, and some of them show sort of a more variable pattern across the brain. So there's a, a good mix of expression patterns, um, and most genes fall into one of these 32 patterns overall. Um, I also want to point out in, this, in the lower left here that these patterns, um, in general, for um, any gene of interest that you care about or for this um, module eigen genes can be viewed anatomically, and these anatomical visualizations for genes can be seen on the website. But what we what we wanted to ask is where are most differentially stable genes fell in these patterns, and that's what this next uh, highest chart is showing. Um, you can see that for basically all the patterns, these top 10% of genes with the most consistent expression across the brain they fall into almost all of these patterns. So so this suggests plus that genes that are important for function and dysfunction um, are not limited to genes expressed in a particular region. So for this first part, um, I hope I showed the Human Brain Atlas provides useful multimodal resource for studying the adult human brain. Um, this resource is commonly used to identify expression patterns of individual genes, um, but we can use the entire microarray data set uh, to find genes 
to find that genes that show consistent patterning between brains also tend to be important for brain function and for dysfunction. So the next atlas I wanted to move on to um, is the mouse brain atlas. Um, this mouse uh, brain atlas, um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. I also want to point out that the data from this mouse brain atlas can be downloaded from the application programming interface. I'm not going to talk about that at all other than to say it's there. And some of the raw data that I'm going to be using for comparisons actually came from, from here. But it's the same data that's in the mouse uh, brain atlas. And so some of the key features of this mouse brain atlas is that the genome-wide, brain-wide insight hybridization atlas of the adult mouse brain. So there's about 30,000 um, uh, genes that will run um, almost all of them in sagittal section and about 4,000 in coronal section. Um, each of these were then quantified and mapped onto a 3D reference atlas, um, which allows comparison between genes, uh, between regions, and then across different uh, mouse brains. Um, and that this data is all available to view and download online. So um, the way that this resource is commonly used is to look for a particular gene of interest and see where it's expressed in the brain. So for example, CDH11 um, is expressed and across a lot of the brain, you can see, uh, including neocortex on the left and hippocampus. Um, you can also ask which genes are most highly correlated with a particular gene of, gene of interest in the brain. And this uses the quantification um, from this insight hybridization. So this shows a few examples here of that. And then you can ask which genes are most highly expressed in a particular area of the brain. So for example, in mouse cerebellum, this Purkinje cell protein 2 is very highly expressed in just the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum but very low expression pretty much anywhere else in the brain. So what we wanted to do is to compare the expression patterns sort of across um, many genes in the genome between mouse and human brain. So here you can see an example of, of the CDH11 on the left in human in the anatomical um, format that I was talking about for displaying the microarrays, and in the right for the quantification in mouse. And so what we hypothesized was that there'd be many genes that show consistent patterns between species, um, but that a small number would differ considerably. And there are similar results that have been shown in neocortex, which I'll get to in the next slide. And determining which genes show distinct patterns in mouse and human might be useful for considering mouse models of, of disease. So in, in the cortex, um, Earlier work from the Allen Institute and has, has using insight hybridization of about a thousand selected genes in human and mouse found that about three quarters of these showed consistent patterns uh, between species. And so that's what's shown on the right. And the bottom part of this right plot shows some examples of genes that have high expression in a particular layer of cortex um, in both mouse and human uh, in a conserved way. And some of the ones towards the top are examples of interneuron related uh, marker genes that again show conserved expression between species. Um, in, on the other hand, about a quarter of the genes in one of two cortical regions, uh, and in most cases both of those two cortical regions, show distinct patterns between species. So that's what's shown above here. Some of them, their patterns were different because they were in different layers. In other cases, there was an added layer or there were multiple cell types or in Rare cases, they switched from cytochrome uh, to inhibitory neuron markers. Um, and so what we wanted to look at brain-wide, whether we found similar um, things, whether we found genes that were you know, very different either. You know, maybe, for example, in human, maybe they're expressed in cortex, whereas in mouse, maybe they're expressed in cerebellum. And so we did that by basically comparing our our human, the human microarray data from human brain atlas that gets the quantification of these data here, which I'll get to right, right now. And so the way this works is we first identified um, groups of genes with the similar expression patterns in human using WGCNA. This is what I talked about earlier, these 32 patterns that we found. Um, then what we did is we took the, each of these 32 gene lists and we found a subset of genes that were in each of those lists that had reliable expression in mouse. And the way we define genes with reliable expression in mouse is for the approximately 4,000 genes for both a sagittal and a coronal series 
was done in in-site hybridization, we took the around 80% of those where the quantifications based on the sagittal and coronal sections agreed. And so there were about 2,500 to 3,000 genes that had consistent expression in mouse and also had a microarray probe in human. Um, and so what we what we did is we, as I mentioned, we took for each of those 32 lists, we took those that subset um, in with reliable expression. We looked, we averaged the expression in mouse from comparable regions to the regions that were um, found in the human microarray, and then we compared the quantifications based on the human microarray for those brain regions against the in situ hybridization quantifications for the same brain regions in mouse and compared. And so we compare both the gene groups, the 32 groups, as well as the individual genes, both for consistent and differential patterns between species. And so when we did this, we found several gene expression patterns that are highly preserved between species. Um, in, many, in many cases, these related to either neuronal cell types or to region-specific genes. And we found several patterns that were also poorly preserved, which were generally um, glia in many cases. And so this, this plot on the left shows uh, basically a single number that I'm not going to go into what it means, where the bigger the number, the more consistent expression there is between mouse and human overall for those groups. And so, for example, this M6 module showed um, very conserved expression between species. And you can see this by these bar plots. In the bar plots, the green represents um, common um, expression in mouse and human. The blue would be human-specific expression. And the orange would be mouse-specific expression. So the pattern overall for mouse and human is the same in module 6, where it's high in cortex, which is the bars on the left, and low in the subcortical structures, which are the bars towards the right. On the other hand, this module 30 um, shows a very different expression pattern in mouse and human, um, where in human, which is the light blue, it tends to be highly expressed in sort of a, a, a small subset of subcortical areas, and it tends to be low in cortex, whereas in mouse, in the orange, it tends to be higher in cortex and lower in some of the other structures. And these insets here show the, the same, um, sort of a scatter plot of the same thing. You can see the high correlation for module 6 and the low correlation for module 30. So this suggests these patterns as a whole, some of them agree well between species and some of them agree less well. And so the question is, another question that we wanted to ask is for the individual genes in these groups, do they all follow the pattern of the group as a whole? Or do the different patterns, or do the genes in the different patterns, do some of them agree between species and some of them not agree between species? And so it turned out that about, for all of these 32 different groups, between about 5 and 20% of the genes in each group switch their pattern um, between human and mouse. And that's what's shown on the bottom bar plot down here. The red bars are the ones that switch their pattern. The green ones are the ones that agree particularly well between species. And while this, the number that agree particularly well um, is sort of dropped off, um, there are always some that disagree or that change their pattern. What I mean by changing their pattern is these would be genes where in human, they have a particular pattern. In mouse, not only do they not show the same pattern, but instead they're highly correlated with a different human pattern, which suggests that they aren't, it's not just that we don't have the power statistically to make this comparison. It's that these genes are actually switching to a different pattern um, compared to what they're doing in humans. And this is true even for these highly preserved modules. So I have a couple of examples of genes that both agree and disagree with this species for this module 6, which as a whole is a consistent module. So these Two genes on the left, as with the module, show the high expression in neocortex um, and lower expression in subcortex. Um, the one on the right um, is one that's in the same group where in human it has the same pattern, but in mouse it's just expressed in this very specific, um, I believe that's either C3 or the dente gyrus, um, but nowhere else. Um, and then this module 30, where as a whole, many of the genes in mouse disagree, like this one on the right. However, there's at least two here, this myelin basic protein and the CDH11, um, where their patterns in mouse and human agree. So overall, um, we see that, that this mouse atlas provides a useful multimodal resource for studying the adult, let's just say the adult mouse brain. 
Um, the research is common, the resource is commonly used to identify expression patterns of individual genes. Um, there's one component of this resource, which is the downloadable expression data for each gene that's mapped onto a 3D reference atlas. And we were able to identify sets of genes with highly consistent and with highly discrete gene expression signatures between the mouse and human brain at the level of anatomical regions. And so this analysis builds on similar studies in neocortex and may provide insight into differences between mouse and human neurodevelopment and disease. Okay, and so to move on to the last part of, of this talk, I wanted to talk about the um, NIH Blueprint on Human Primate Atlas. Um, and so this atlas, um, there are several key, key features of this atlas. There's an anatomical, there's some anatomical reference data, both for M MRI and for histology um, that were done on the, on the postnatal um, samples from, or donors from the study. Um, there's also um, cellular resolution gene expression or in situ hybridization that was done um, on, I believe, 46 of the genes, of the of genes in um, genome. And then the primary component of this atlas is a microarray uh, profiling of laser microdissected samples. So um, this microarray component includes about 2,000 arrays and is very useful because it's both complete, or it's very extensive in both its temporal coverage as well as has fine anatomical resolution. So there's 10 ages that were sampled, six prenatal and four postnatal, with three to four um, individuals per age. And then there were five brain regions that were sampled at very fine anatomical resolution. So two cortical regions, hippocampus, um, striatum, and amygdala, and a little bit of thalamus uh, prenatally. Um, but this is very complete uh, and interesting resource for um, looking at these these particular um, brain regions in a, a non-human primate model. Um, you can ask a lot of the same questions here as they can be asked with these other ones. So, for example, in the middle here, it's a heat map of a handful of genes um, across different areas of the, uh, the brain and across different time. You can ask where they're expressed. You can ask which genes are highly correlated with what is your genes of interest. You can ask differential expression between different layers of the cortex or between um, cortex and the striatum. Um, many of the same things I talked about with the other apps. Um, what we wanted to focus on was development of layers of the cortex. Um, and so in this atlas, um, the D1 component focuses on this laminar development. Um, the, six neo, the six prenatal time points were chosen as the times of peak neurogenesis of for neurons for different layers of cortex. And then the four postnatal time points were chosen as a sort of a neonate, an infant, a juvenile, and a young adult um, time point. And so this here in the middle shows a cross section of the V1 uh, neocortex at these different time points. And these color bars show the basically progression of the different layers that are available for laser microdissection at each time. And so at the earlier time points, there's a lot of this red and pink, which were our progenitor layers, the cells that continue to divide to make neurons later on. And then as time progresses, you get more of these um, orange and yellow uh, colors, which represent the six layer structure of, of the adult cortex that uh, are people, uh, yeah, that are, seen, that are seen in adults. And so this is a useful resource overall because it allows us to ask questions about human neurodevelopment of cortex in a non-human climate model system. So as a little mini primer on the generation of, of the cortex, um, excitatory, neur excitatory neurons are progressively generated from these progenitor cells um, in an inside-out fashion. So there's different flavors of uh, progenitor cells which divide um, and initially form the um, subplate at the free plate. Within the free plate, you get then the layer six neurons which are generated first. Um, later on, the newly generated layer five neurons go through the layer six and then are generated in layer five, then layer four, then layer two, three. So it's generated in inside out fashion before switching to um, gliosis or, or gliogenesis. Sorry. Um, 
And so the important things to remember for this talk are that um, these layers generally consist of different types of excitatory uh, neurons, the ones in layer 6. Uh, many of them are uh, cortical thalamic projection neurons. The ones in layer 2, many of those are uh, colossal projection neurons. So you have different types of these neurons in the different layers. And also, um, that once formed, these neurons persist throughout life. Um, unlike many other organs in the body, once the neurons you have when you're born are, for the most part, the neurons, the neurons that you have when you die, you don't get recycling of new neurons. So, um, and then in adults, um, these cell types for each of these layers have known marker genes. If, if you look at the, the mouse brain atlas, um, you can see marker genes for layer 2-3 that are expressed throughout layer 2-3, that's the top row. You can see ones that are expressed in only subsets of, of cells in layer 2-3. Similarly for layer 5, there are plenty of marker genes that are expressed in all of the cells or in just the upper part of layer 5 or the lower part or in very sparse populations. Um, furthermore, many of these marker genes are known to be conserved between species. So if they're a marker in mouse, they're a marker in human. And that's part of what I showed on a slide earlier. Um, one thing that isn't well understood is whether these genes mark these cell types from the time the neurons are formed or whether these are become marker genes for these cell types or these layers at a much later, later time point. And so that's what we wanted to look into here. Um, and so the way we did is the way we did this is we looked at we took a set of marker genes at um, 48 months for the upper layers, so we combined layer two and three for layer four, for layer five, and layer six. We found the set of genes that were marking those each one of those layers at eight months, which is basically the adult um, time point. And we asked at the earlier time point, what percentage of those genes also mark that same layer at those time points? And what we can see is that the number of common marker genes between each stage, each earlier stage and 48 months, decreases with time, which suggests that this emergence of laminar identity is gradual. And so as an example for layer 6, which is this uh, turquoise color with the number 6, at 12 months, there's about 60% of the common marker genes with adults, about 50% at 3 months, 40% at 0, 30% at U120, and 20% at at E80 and E90. So this progressive increase in laminar identity could be for one of two things. It could either be because when neurons, excitatory neurons are generated, they just look like generic excitatory neurons, and it takes some time for them to get their identity. Another possibility is that when they're formed, they already have an identity, but the genes that are marking those layers are not the same ones that are marking um, the way. The way we address that question was to look at these layer markers at for all the time points and to look for genes that are marker genes for the same layer at multiple time points. And so so that's what this plot on the left shows for layer 5. It's the set of genes where in more than one time point it's marking layer 5. And you can see that there's a set of genes in early time points, so these are these upper left ones, that mark layer 5 early but not later on. There's a set where intermediate time points, they mark layer 5 but not earlier or later. And then there's these set of late markers that mark layer 5 in sort of childhood through adulthood, but not at any earlier time point. And there's a relatively small set of what we call persistent markers that mark layer 5 across development. And so what this tells us is that these layers are discrete from formation, but that they're marked by a progressively changing set of genes. And there are some examples that are shown here on the right. Um, just in this case, to look at layer 6, you can see that this, on the bottom row, this SLC26A7, that's high expression in layer 6, but only at E9 and E120, so only late prenatal time. This LGR5 has high expression only from E120 through 3 months. The CA12 is expressed in layer 6 primarily, but only from 12 months to 48 months. And then there's this 6 which is expressed in layer 6 across development. So there seems to be 
a unique signature for these different layers across time, but that it is marked by progressively changing genes. So in summary, um, this atlas um, provides a useful multimodal resource for studying um, neurodevelopment in a well-studied non-human primate system. Um, this resource is well-suited for studying spatiotemporal expression patterns of individual genes. Um, we find that the cortical layers have distinct gene expression patterns across development, but that the genes marking each layer change with time, which means that this, the canonical markers for adult cortical layers might not be appropriate to use when studying the development setting. Something would have to be you know, taken into consideration. So overall, I hope I've shown that there are many useful tools available from the Allen Brain Atlas Data Portal for studying the brain across development in several species. Um, I, provi I provided three transcriptional examples here about how these atlases can be applied to study brain development and disease. Um, genes with conserved patterning in the brain. Um, first, I showed in human that genes with conserved patterning in the brain tend to be important for brain function and dysfunction, but that the particular pattern or their absolute expression level isn't as important in this context. Um, there's also a small but significant number of diversely patterned genes that show species differences, um, which presents an important consideration when translating results from mouse studies to humans. Um, also, cortical layers change their signature genes across development, which suggests that it's important both where in the brain you look as well as when. Um, and then I finally wanted to leave you on the thought that while we and others have asked many interesting biological questions using these atlases, um, there's a ton of data here, and there's many other questions that are waiting to be studied. So we encourage people to go and look up things for yourself and make your own discoveries using these data. So that's my talk. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, this work involves a lot of people doing a lot of different things at the Allen Institute, and it's definitely not a one or two person uh, show. It's a, it's a very big project. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, do you normalize for cell numbers? Um, the short answer, well, so, so the microarray data is all normalized for the amount of RNA that's in a piece of tissue. It does so it, it normalizes for cell number in the sense that if you have more cells in the tissue, you're going to have more RNA, and that gets normalized for. Um, the distribution of different kinds of cells in a particular piece of tissue is something that is, I think, a very interesting other topic. But the, the total amount of RNA is what gets normalized for in the microarray. Uh, for the in-situ hybridization quantification, the numbers represent a combination of the intensity of staining in cells in a piece of, in, in, a, in a voxel or in a little area of the ISH in combination with the percentage of area that's occupied by, um, by stain. So it's a combination of intensity plus density that is with the number that's, that's uh, given out. Okay. That makes sense. And next. Oh, I'm sorry, were you, had you concluded? Yes. Okay, your next one is, could you please define differential stability? So differential stability is defined as the average Pearson correlation across brain regions of, um, of genes in, of pairwise across brain regions for the six brains in the study. So let me go back to the slide. So, for example, what we would do is between brains one and two, we would take the height of each of these bars um, in brain one, compare it to the height of each of the bars in brain two, and get a, a Pearson correlation, so a value between negative one and one. We would then do that for one versus three, one versus four, one versus five, and so on, and then take the average value across the six brains. Um, and in practice, it turned out that the highest ones were pretty close to one, the lowest ones were around 0.2 or 0.3. 
So, so it's the average Pearson correlation between brains. This next one is kind of a two-parter. Can we use this brain atlas data set for other uh, high-throughput studies? And how authentic and reliable are these data sets from 0 to 100 percent? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. Can we use this brain atlas data set for other high-throughput studies? And how authentic and reliable are these data sets from 0 to 100 percent reliable and authentic? Okay, well, so for the first part, um, you can use these data sets for really anything you want that you can think of. I mean, people have compared, um, say, blood flow based on MRI studies um, in certain areas of the brain against the gene expression level of genes in similar areas of the brain by matching up the locations of the brain from the reference atlas against the locations of the brain on in these MRI studies. Um, really anything you can think of that would involve um, areas of the brain, um, you can compare these, these data against. Um, as for the reliability, I mean, it's hard to put a, a percentage onto it. We normalize quality control as well as we can, um, and I think I think we do a pretty good job of controlling for everything we can think of. Both the raw data as well as the um, normalized data are available. So if people think that our reliability, you know, the way we did it isn't as reliable as could have been done, then you can go back and find things for yourself. But um, I think we do a good job of, of either making it as reliable as possible or in cases where things don't come out well, noting that on, on the website. Okay, and your next one is, can we download this gene data set as a user from the Allen website? Yes, all, all of the data is downloadable in um, multiple forms. The microarray data is typically available by going to the download tab on whatever atlas you're in and downloading it. The mouse data, you can download any individual in situ hybridization image that you're interested in by just, there's a, some button on the, on the image that you're viewing. And then the, the quantifications of the, um, of the data are available through the, um, API in a, a way that's too complicated to explain over the phone, but there are directions on the um, on the API for how to do that. Okay. Um, there appear to be no further questions from the audience, so we'll conclude the presentation. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 13, 2015. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.